We were flying along above solid overcast when we spotted ten bombers. They were lost in the soup and trying to get back to Hanoi. They were going like the devil just to, just above the overcast when we saw them. They couldn't have been more than 30,000 feet above the ground. Evidently, they had jettisoned their bombs to get more speed. When they spotted us, they put their noses down and ran hell-bent for election. We chased them for about ten minutes before we caught them. Sandell sailed in first with the assault echelon, and I followed with my reserve flight. Bob Little stayed above with the support echelon to cover our attack. We went in, in a rat race formation, everybody chasing the tail of the plane ahead. We opened fire, and the bombers seemed to fall into pieces. I saw pieces of engine cowling fall off into space. Glass from the gun turrets flew in all directions. Engines smoked and caught fire. Tails just crumped and fell off. It was the queerest thing I ever saw. Then the air was so full of P-40s dashing all over the place that I worried more about colliding with a P-40 than about the chaps. And that's a quote from Bob Neal, an AVG pilot, recalling the first battle over Kunming in December of 1941. Welcome back and welcome aboard again for part four of the Airfix P-40 build. So the decals in this kit are surprisingly excellent. They're very, very good. And they held up really well. Uh, the the bane of, I think, any modeler's existence is, is the decals or the decals, as the uh, people overseas like to say. But uh, they were very, very good in this kit. Even the shark mouth motif, which being two pieces and you have to line it up just perfectly so that they match they were very good and they held up very very well now speaking of that shark mouth the avg shark mouths that i think made they made famous more than anything were actually stolen from a photograph that the avg members saw of the number 112 squadron of the raf who were who had painted them on the noses of their p40s in north africa and they had stolen it from the BF-110 squadron from Germany. The, and I'm going to butcher this, so excuse me. The Zestorgeschwader 76. Do not hold me accountable for my German pronunciations. I apologize. So it's, it's an interesting bit of stolen history uh, that they have now become famous for, but did not originate. Kind of interesting. Now, the other very, very famous part of the Flying Tiger's scheme is, of course, the Flying Tiger itself, which was famously designed by the Disney Company, and they were made up into decals and sent overseas to where they were then applied onto the airplanes in Burma. And if you see in some of the images, the color images, you'll see the Flying Tiger decal is has a darker paint. The green, the camouflage paint underneath is darker. And that's because they used a lacquer, a clear lacquer over the top, which made it seem like the uh, the paint underneath was discolored. But it wasn't actually repainted. It's just making it seem like that from the lacquer over the top. Now, the scheme that this airplane is being presented in is an aircraft flown by Charles Older, who flew with the third squadron, as we discussed in the last episode, which was the Hell's Angels. Now, Charles, Chuck, as he was known, became a double ace with 10 confirmed victories during his time with the AVG. After the AVG was disbanded, he went back to the United States, but would later return back to China in 1944, where he would add one more victory to his total. He would also serve as deputy commander of the 23rd Fighter Group, as it was later as it had become known at that time. Later, after the war, he became a judge, and he was a California Superior Court judge, presiding very famously over the, char- the trial of Charles Manson. Officially, they were known as the American Volunteer Group. Histories differ, opinions differ on who actually created the name. Some sources say that it was the Time reporter that actually gave them the Flying Tigers nickname. There's other reports, and this is kind of the one I, I believe. Again, it just depends on who you read and in the history of it, but this one does make the most sense to me from what I've read, was that there was a U.S. reporter in China at the time, and he heard the Chinese call these men Fei Hu, 
which means Flying Tiger. Of course, that's an awesome nickname. So it stuck, he brought it back, and then it became history. Throughout their time in China, the Flying Tigers were on the defensive most of the time. They were hugely outnumbered, and if you believe certain people, in obsolete airplanes. But they knew how to fight the Japanese. And despite what the, as you saw in the beginning, the front of this box, the Flying Tigers probably never actually tangled with zeros. A lot of the confusion comes from, at the time, a lot of the American servicemen called pretty much every airplane that the Japanese flew a zero. But the famous zero, the Navy version, the Navy zero, was not operating in this area. What they were probably fighting against a lot of the times were Sally's, Anne's, Nate's, and Oscar's. Oscar kind of looks like a zero, though. By the end of February, Rangoon was lost to the Japanese offensive. The Flying Tigers moved to Magwe in Burma. Aircraft att attrition was, for them was so high at this point that individual squadron distinctions really became meaningless. And then at this time, eight Flying Tiger P-40s and 15 RAF Hurricanes. That's an important thing to note. A lot of the times in the history and in the lore and in our quote-unquote memories of this time, even though we weren't there, we kind of envisioned the Flying Tigers flying by themselves, this lone American squadron in the face of this great Japanese march across western China. But the Royal Air Force was there, and they had been there for quite some time, so they were actually fighting alongside a lot of RAF, some Australians as well, and New Zealand. But at this time, from Magwe, eight AVG pilots and 15 RAF hurricanes faced 271 Japanese aircraft. Those are some immense odds. 115 of these airplanes were fighters the rest bombers, and this forced a retreat from Burma completely and into China where they settled at Loi Wing. It was during this time at Loi Wing that the Flying Tigers then started receiving the first batch of P-40Es, which were destined for the what was going to become the 23rd Fighter Group that was going to replace the AVG once the U.S. was able to get full servicemen over there. However, this time they were forced to evacuate to Baoshan. By May 4th, the Japanese campaign in Burma was all but over, and they began building a bridge to cross the Salween River, which would allow the Japanese then to move troops into China from Burma and then onwards to Kunming. For four days, Flying Tiger pilots flew continuous missions into the Mile Deep Canyon and effectively neutralized the Japanese troops and prevented an advance on Kunming. While writing later, General Claire Chennault, the famous leader of the American Volunteer Group and later the 14th Air Force, he wrote, quote, the AVG had staved off China's collapse on the Salween, end quote. By June of 1942, personnel that would form the 23rd Fighter Group began arriving in China, and the Flying Tigers had their last combat mission over Hengwan the very day that the group was disbanded on July 4th, 1942. During this mission, the American Volunteer Group shot down four KI-27 Nates with no losses of their own. And with that ended, the American Volunteer Group disbanded in July of 1942, then replaced by the 23rd Fighter Group of the 14th Air Force. I'm going to start fading this paint with my first experiment with using oil paints as, as fading. And I think it went okay. It wasn't great. It wasn't the worst. But I think it went okay. It was a, it was a huge learning curve for me doing this type of, this type of work. So I kind of use a, a mixture of different techniques that I've read about, I've seen videos on, uh, I'm just trying different things to see how it works, uh, and seeing what worked out, what worked, what didn't. So I, I try a little bit of a dot filtering technique on the bottom, using the titanium white, and, and that looked actually really, really good. I think it faded some of those, panel, those, those panels out nicely. There wouldn't be a lot of fading on the bottom of the airplane, but I just wanted to beat it up. And then again, being the bottom of the airplane, you can't see it that well. So it's a great place to try to experiment on some things. So I did that. And then I also tried some contrast shading, doing, some, doing a little bit of oil work, brown oil work, using the burnt sienna on the forward edge of the, of the panel lines. And then the white, titanium white on the, on the rear edge. Just get a little contrast. And I think it dirtied up the airplane quite nicely. Where I had a lot of trouble with was playing around with some staining from engine exhaust and oil leaks from the cowl flaps on the bottom, staining the belly of the fuselage. Put some oil on there, didn't like how it looked, took it all off, 
did it again, took it off. I did it four, I believe four, maybe five times before I came to something that I actually kind of enjoyed uh, and I think looked pretty good. The other problem I had was the titanium white on the camouflage surfaces was too overpowering and it left a white film all up over the top. Ended up wiping all that off, again, using mineral spirits, which is the great thing about oils, is you can try something. If it doesn't look good, mineral spirits, I'll wipe it up and try all over again. And ended up going back and doing uh, some upper surface fading with a more transparent white color, uh, zinc white. Ended up going getting a, a zinc white and trying that up on the top, and that worked a lot better. Other areas on the bottom of the fuselage where I really tried to dirty things up was behind the wheel wells, imagining these airplanes working off of mostly dirt, almost exclusively dirt fields, muddy fields. They're going to kick up a lot of dust and dirt right behind those wheel wells, and they're going to get dirty. So I concentrated a lot of browns there, and when it became too heavy, I just backed it off with some white, tried to mix that in, and then if it just absolutely didn't look great at all, I uh, just wiped the whole thing away and started over again. Again, like I said, great thing about oils is wipe it off, start all over. And you'll see that here as I'm using some of that burnt sienna on the ailerons and the tails. The right side, or I should say the left side, excuse me, the left side of the airplane, the left side of the airplane, the right side of, so if we're looking at it, just way too heavy. And the left side's a lot more subtle. I like that look a little, a lot better. So I ended up going back, wiping that right side off. And then trying it again and got it to something that I think is manageable. Another thing to note about these decals is they're actually incorrect. If you are one that's a stickler for accuracy and it's in all forms, the shark mouth on all these airplanes were hand painted on each of the airplanes, so none of them are alike. They're all very uh, individual to the airplane. And if you look at pictures of White 68, Chuck Older's plane, the shark mouth doesn't match the decal that is included with this model. So if you if you wanted to be truly accurate, you have to go get a new decal set or hand paint it yourself and try to match it up. The other thing that's incorrect is the round is the roundels, uh, the Chinese national insignia on these. Each triangle and the sun sunbeams should be an individual triangle rather than connected like they are on this. They also look a little pale, a little bit too pale. The blue should be. A little darker, a little deeper, but you know, it kind of helped a little bit without with the fading, and so I didn't have to do so much work on fading them out to match in with the faded paint colors, but they should be a little bit darker. Painting up the exhaust was quite the challenge just because of how small they are, getting them off the sprues and then and then trying to paint them up and look them, make them look kind of realistic. Again, my first try doing anything like this, it worked out fairly well. It's just it was just so small that you, you can't. It's hard to see, and it was really hard to work with. Really hard to work with these parts. But I just started hand brushing uh, aluminum on as a base, and then I got these Tamiya weathering powders that I wanted to try out. So I got uh, a gunmetal and then applied that on top of the silver to give it a gunmetal sheen. Even though it's not a gun, obviously it's an exhaust. But uh, just give it a metallic sheen that's not so bright and aluminum, you know, vibrant. Just a darker, dirtier uh, metal. Now, my camera did cut out, so I didn't get all of this on camera. But then after that, I went through and using a sponge, a clean sponge, different sides of the sponge every time, I used the, the Vallejo dark brown and then just sponged that on top. And that was fairly heavy. And then I went back another section of the sponge, taking most of it off on a, uh, a piece of paper towel in light rust, and then yellow ochre, finally. Each one a little bit less and a little bit less. And then what you can uh, kind of see how they look here, and they, you know, add that a little bit of a rust. Rust, even though exhaust don't necessarily rust, but they have that rust-type color to them. And I think it, it simulated that look fairly well. Again, just the, the challenge with it was just because it was so small and trying to do a little bit, it was very easy to overpower the whole thing just because the piece was so small. After all that had dried, added a little bit of grime and dirt and gunk to it by putting on some of the Paneline accent color, the black Paneline accent color. Once that dried, cleaned a little bit of it off and I think it came out looking fairly nice. In the end, the Flying Tigers were credited with 297 aircraft destroyed, 229 of these in the air. Now keep in mind, every time they shot one down, they were promised $500 
229 times. 14 American Volunteer Group pilots were killed in action, captured, or missing in action. Two were killed in bombing raids, and another six in accidents. A quite impressive record, considering they served at the end of one of the longest supply lines with minimal support, with quote-unquote inferior equipment, against staggering odds, and having never fielded more than 25 airplanes at any one time. A lot of these early airplanes lacked the modern optical gun sights of the time and instead used a homemade ring and post gun sight. Winston Churchill was quoted as saying, quote, The victories of these Americans over the rice paddies of Burma are comparable in character, if not in scope, with those won by the RAF over the hot fields of Kent in the Battle of Britain, end quote. And if that's not high praise coming from Winston Churchill, then I don't know what is. The other thing, if you're going to work on this model, you have to be careful of is the machine guns, the in-wing machine guns, are extremely fragile. And I broke the two off on the uh, left wing uh, almost right away. So if you go and look at some of the earlier videos of me working on it, you'll see there's no machine guns on that wing. So I, but I was able to save them. I had them. Again, it's one of those things where I, it sh they probably should be replaced with some metal needles or something like that of, of similar size. I didn't really have anything, and I didn't feel like going out and buying anything, so I just reattached the, the plastic pieces back to where they were supposed to be as best I could, and then painted them up in the black. But they were so fragile that I wasn't even going to try to put any of the, like the, the gunmetal powder on them to make them uh, that color. It just wasn't worth it at that point. Final bits and pieces, the pitot tube on this one was a cranked pitot tube, that one that has a kind of a Z shape to it. And if you look at the instructions call for the wrong pitot tube for this airplane. They have the old, the newer style pitot tubes for the P-40s, but looking at pictures of Chuck Holder's plane in Burma uh, in World War II, he had the cranked pitot tube. So the instructions actually call out the wrong one. You should be using this one. For the display base, I was originally going to do a blood chit as on the display base, kind of like, well, not the whole thing, but just a, a, ma, a little bit of piece, like kind of a piece of the blood chit that they wore on their flight jackets. But I just decided it was going to be too hard, especially for how small the base was. So I decided to, uh, instead to go just with the Chinese national insignia roundel, each with the individual triangles. So I painted that onto the uh, a wood base that I just I got from a, a craft store. And so here it is all painted up. And I'm weathering it, beating it up, and putting on this uh, the oil work to stain it, get some streaks on it, look like it's been dripping oil or anything like that. I'm not trying to make it look like anything in particular, just kind of worn and weathered and that sort of thing. So that's all I was going for with that. It turned out okay. It's not the greatest. I kind of, I don't know, I think it looks a little bit too streaky, maybe. It looks all right. Uh, I'm not 100% happy with it, but it's just a display base, so... So here it is, the final reveal. The Airfix 172nd P-40 as flown by Chuck Holder of the Hells Angels of the American Volunteer Group. Now it's not great. There's a lot of mistakes on it. There's a lot of inaccuracies on it. But I think it, I think it turned out pretty well. Especially for me trying some new things on this. Experimenting with some things. I honestly say I think, I think it turned out pretty good. And I'm going to compare it to my old Ravel, technically monogram, P-40, that is horribly inaccurate. But if you ignore the inaccuracies of the, the mold itself and just go off of the paint and the build quality, this is one of the last models I made before I, I went on my hiatus for like 13 years. And so this is where I feel like it's very easy to compare yourself if you're looking online and you're looking at other YouTube videos and you're looking at in these Facebook groups that you may be part of, of modeling groups, and you compare yourself to these people who have amazing talents and amazing skills that you may not be there yet. Don't compare yourself to that. Compare yourself to yourself. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm comparing myself to myself 13, 15, I think maybe 15 years ago on this one, something like that. I don't remember exactly when I built it. Entirely hand-painted, you know, straight out of the box. A little bit of, you know, sanding, maybe some filling, but really not much. And comparing that to what I did this time, and I think it's a huge improvement. And that's what I'm going for each and every time that I'm building is improving on myself, beating myself, right? Comparing myself to myself. That's how I improve. And I think I accomplished that. 
The Flying Tiger's exploits in the early days of the war quickly became the stuff of legend that continues to this day. The Flying Tiger name was continued on, adopted by the entirety of the 14th Air Force serving in China, continuing to be led by Claire Chennault. And they fought on in China, again, in austerior conditions, at the end of the longest supply route, with the lowest priority for supplies for the remainder of the war. The 23rd Fighter Group continues the Flying Tiger name and tradition to this day, and they currently fly A-10s out of Moody Air Force Base in Georgia. The P-40 Warhawk was never the best airplane, but neither was it ever a bad airplane. And I believe, if you look at its combat record, was mo- one of the most effective aircraft of the war, especially in the hands of skilled pilots. Perhaps Phil Loughborough, future commander of the 23rd Fighter Group in China, summed it up best when he said, quote, I flew the P-40 for three and a half years in the States, Iceland, India, and China. I have taken off from grass, mixed clay and rock, concrete, and a carrier deck, and the airplane never let me down. It did what it was designed to do, and a lot of things the designers never dreamed of. I liked it. End quote. And I think that'll end it for this episode. I hope you did learn a little something about the P-40. Maybe you learned a little something about some techniques for the building side. Leave a comment. Let me know what you liked, what you didn't like. As this is my first go around, I'm, you know, still figuring things out. Thank you so much for watching. I sincerely appreciate it. And please join me next time for another episode of Building History.